if you don't know God well enough, it's hard to actually gauge whether what you think he's saying to you or whatever is correct or not, which is why Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. You know, and if you stick to following him, he is going to lead you to a relationship with the father, which will be intimate. And which will reveal the truth of who God is, which will enable you to understand things differently than trying to work it out and figure it out. Which is why I've got a problem with people basing their lives on theology, which is their understanding of God through the Bible, which requires their understanding of the Bible. I was brought up in the church where where they taught us that that God is omniscient, omnipotent, um, yeah. and yeah. present, and uh, been listening now to Key Fairchild, and I'm thinking, well, that makes more sense because she says no, because if God God was was everywhere at the time and seeing all this evil, then then he'd be responsible to stop it. So she's going on that he's omnipresent though he's loving everything everywhere through us is kind of what she's she's okay um said th those words weren't actually in the bible so yeah. well no they're not in the bible but there are indications towards that in you know in him we live and move and have our being everything exists you know by him and through him and everything else i think in a, in a sense, even if he was omnipresent, I don't believe that would mean that he would have to stop everything. Um, because he gives us the choices to do and he doesn't stop us making those choices. Therefore, he's not responsible for the things that are going on, both the negative things people do and the good things people don't do. So... You know, I don't think we can blame him and being everywhere. And I mean, God, God is infinite and outside of time and space as well as transcendent, as well as the imminent. And I agree, the imminent is in us, but he is in everybody. You know, that is, so if he's in everybody, he knows what everyone's doing. So I would not agree that he doesn't know what's going on because God's spirit is in everyone and therefore knows what everyone's thinking and what everyone's doing. But it's not his responsibility to stop it. It's, we can pray and ask him to do certain things or we can do certain things, but it's not his responsibility. You can't blame God. Um, and to say if he saw everything, he would have to do something about it. Why? You know, wh why would he have to do something about it? You know, that, that would be my question there. Why would he have to do something about it? If we've done something or are doing something, why would he have to stop it? You know, I don't, I don't follow the logic in that, in that um, question. Um, is God all powerful? Yes, but that doesn't mean he does everything he can. Again, He's chosen to limit himself in what he does through us. You know, I don't believe in the sovereignty of God. Therefore, everything that happens must be God's will. And it was he wanted it to happen. That is more fate or sort of more of a Muslim type way of thinking about God. Um, so I, I personally believe that God is in everybody and is aware of everything. In a transcendent sense. Um, and he's imminent in everybody and i believe he's present in it because everything is made out of him and made in him so he can't be separated from anything in that way um does he know everything well it's it's a difficult question to ask isn't it <laughs> in a sense um he's god therefore he's infinite and in that sense, he doesn't know what I'm going to do next. Yeah, you know, he doesn't know what you're going to do next, but he does know what you're thinking about, which is for some people a a, a huge shock or a huge problem, um, um, depending on how you're thinking, I guess.
But I do believe that since the resurrection, that God was breathed into everyone and his spirit was resides in everyone. And he's looking to make himself known to everyone and looking for everyone to come into a realization of who he is uh, in, in that specific way. Is God in every angelic being or, or every sort of fallen angelic being? No, I don't believe he is because they are not human beings and he, he's chosen to dwell in us in a different way than he's chosen to engage with the rest of creation. Um, but God is good and he's always good and he wants to bless everyone. And his desire is to restore everything. And he's chosen to use us to do that. So you could say God has chosen to limit himself to work through mankind. But that doesn't mean that he can't do things to help us or to encourage us or to guide and direct us. Because uh, he, he wants to, to be relationally involved in our lives. You know, yeah. but Micah, yeah, go on. sorry, I, I, I look at it from another angle. Uh, he's designed us in such a way that uh, we need to have the kingdom established in our own life be mm. be before we have to be able to govern our own lives before we can do anything else outside. And we see the mess that the world is in because we have these people who have actually not cannot even govern their own life. They are corrupt to such an extent. Yeah. And when they extend, no matter what you do, if man's heart is not changed internally, um, they, they will circumvent every law to do whatever they want to do. And you can see that it's happening in the in the US and all over the world at the yeah. moment. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that God can't use anybody unless they're perfect um therefore i mean god used cyrus god used other people in the past you know um and he uses us if we're willing you know so it's not like oh i have to be 100 percent in in perfect perfect because he sees me that way anyway so does my heart have to be right for him to use me no but if my heart is mixed in motive or anything else, then I'm not going to be credited with what I'm doing in a sense, because it will be wood, hay and straw. But the gold, silver and precious stones that I do seems to indicate there's a mixture that we do things and even do the things that God desires us to do. But we may not always do it with the right heart or motive, but we still do it. Um, but obviously God wants us to be transformed and he wants us to be more and more like him and to be see the kingdom established in our lives in that if we know who we are and we know our true identity as sons of God, then we will begin to manifest the reality of that true identity. And that true identity can only be found in relationship. So ultimately, we're never going to be able to outwork who we really are unless we really know him. And that is his goal, that we would be in intimate relationship with him and he would reveal himself to us and he would reveal ourselves to us. If you like, he would show us the true reality of who we are. And then we can begin to function out of that reality. Um, but God, I think or uses imperfect vessels otherwise we'd all be striving for perfection before anyone could do anything for god and i don't think god looks at it that way and you know you can do things you can do the wrong things with the right heart and he, he looks at that because we're not always the wisest in what we do or how we do it but it doesn't mean that that he won't use it and of course he brings good out of everything we do so he looks to try and um use what we do even even the foolish things and bring and redeem them to bring something good at all because he's so good you know he's merciful you know he's gracious and i think that sort of he's faithful and when we're faithless he's faithful so you know i don't i'm not sure 
when we come to look at how God does things and because if if God has chosen to do things through us and we're not good enough, then he's never going to do anything, you know. And I think fortunately he's not looking for um us to get everything hundred percent perfectly right because he's more interested in us doing things out of his heart rather than in a legalistic way so i don't believe god gives us a list of instructions and we have to get them all right in order perfectly i think god reveals his heart to us and he wants us to express his heart through who he's made us to be you know therefore our identity will release his heart yeah mike it, it uh the king because it's omniscient right and uh, all these trillions of small little decisions to establish the kingdom mm -hmm. he doesn't get uh well if i i'm not available if i'm not willing then he goes to uh you know b and c and d and e uh, and that re this resilience is built into mankind right God has taken care of all these little uh, programming decisions where everything is concerned. You know, the kingdom will be established. Yeah, but I think God, I think it's more like that God makes adjustments for the things we do to ensure that eventually his kingdom will be manifested. So there's almost like little adjustments. I don't know if you ever saw the, the movie, The Adjustment Bureau in that these people came oh, yeah. in <laughs> things to make sure everything was all on track you know and i think god does make adjustments to enable things to take place so yes he might use somebody else should i fail to respond or listen or be available um but if i do and i don't do it 100 percent correct i think he can still use what i do and make the adjustments necessary i mean it would take God to be able to work with 7 billion people and all their decisions to ensure ultimately that whatever decisions we do make won't stop his ultimate will being perfect, being perfected because ultimately he wants to restore everything. You know, so he's, he's continually at work to bring about that restoration through us and through the angelic realm and through the cloud of witnesses and through anyone else who's willing to to be involved um, and along the way i think there's all sorts of little course corrections that go so we go off here but he brings us back over there so we can carry on he doesn't say oh well okay carry on and eventually it's like oh, well we'll be so far away that we can't get back you know he's always looking to direct and guide us and help us back to the place where we can fully be embracing that relationship and intimacy that hence you know adam and eve did something wrong he goes to find them he didn't just say oh well that's it then tough you know he he made the initiative to go and find them he took the initiative to engage with noah and abraham and moses and all the people that he has used in some way the initiative is always his and I think he's continually at work in us and around us and through us to help ultimately things become into a state of restoration. Yeah, I I, I bet if Bill Gates can do it with Microsoft and weekly uh, <laughs> updates, I don't think it's a, it's just a sort of small matter for God to actually, you know, I mean, there was a major update uh, uh, in 2000 years ago when he shifted his operating system right back to us, right? Yeah, yeah that, absolutely, that, yeah. That was a major update. And... It was. Uh, it's just people have the choice of what, what they do. You know, there's the possibility of everyone experiencing God's love and presence and operating from that perspective, or people can ignore that and carry on operating from their old mindset it's the renewed mind that enables us to operate according to god's heart and his thoughts 
if we keep thinking according to our own understanding, then we're still going to make decisions based on an old program, if you like, or old programming. It's like, you know, you can be reprogrammed, but still operate on, let's say we've had an update to, you know, what are we on now? Windows 11. Well, some people are still running on, you know, Windows Vista, perish the thought. You know, because they've never upgraded their machine, you know, but it's available. And I think everything's available, but are people taking advantage of what is available? I don't think they always are because I think they've, you know, we're still operating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and their own understanding. Whereas God is there to help them come into that transformation, transformed state and to operate from a new mindset but people have to come into agreement with that god doesn't force it it's like you know even microsoft never forced an update you know they didn't force you they do remove um updates on programs so you know windows 8 and all those things they're no longer they're no longer given updates so that sort of is, uh, well, I'm no longer updating this. So you, you use this at your own risk type of thing. Um, and they do usually give you a warning. Hey, we're removing updates from this program or this program or Windows itself from this date. And if you choose to use it after that, there are no more fixes, you know. Um, and I think God has given us the opportunity to have our minds renewed and to have a complete renewal of everything. And sometimes I think he does give us warnings to help us see this is not the best way we're going using this old program. Yeah. Because when new programs come out, they don't all, always run on the old thing. You know, you couldn't run the programs you're running now on Windows 7 would they wouldn't work you know and i and i think god allows us to see that things don't work for us to then look for something that does work you know he just doesn't stop everything dead and say right that's it tough luck end of he always gives an opportunity for for an upgrade you know yeah. i'm sure jesus uh had to come you know, somewhere in, in this century, he would be, he wouldn't be talking about rivers of living water and all that. He would be talking about the new operating system and how to, how to work with it, you know? Well, he might be, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, he may well be using modern analogies and that's why we can, you know, we can use analogies of things to help people understand from a modern perspective. There aren't that many farmers and fishermen around who are going to understand the whole principles of sowing and fishing and all of that stuff. So, yeah, I'm sure he does use, or get, has people to use modern analogies to help people understand. And I'm sure Jesus would have been, you know, operating in the 21st century terminology and analogy, not the first, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of Christians still want to operate in the first. <laughs> yeah. Um, sadly um, but yeah but you know god is good jesus is good he, they they're not trying to make it hard for us they want us to come into a realization they want us to discover the amazing truth of the fantastic reality of what is possible what's available you know that our new identity and our new in our inheritance is all there you know he's adopted mankind it's just people are still living as orphans because they've not accepted that adoption. You know, not they've not accepted what God has done, what Jesus has done. So they're still living as if he hasn't done it, but he has done it and he's finished the work, but they're choosing not to avail themselves either through ignorance or through self-righteousness or basically stubbornness or whatever it might be. The reason why, you know, I, I can't really understand why people wouldn't want a relationship with God once you had one. But then I know a lot of people who took a long time to get to the point where they did. Paul being one. Yeah. Paul had 
understanding of all the types and shadows that were promising the Messiah and the conditions for him coming and everything else. And yet he was still resisting Jesus working within him to reveal who he was, you know, and it took a sort of blinding light to bring him to his senses so he could actually see, well, who are you? I'm Jesus, the one you've been trying to persecute. You know, but Paul then realized because God revealed Jesus in him and he came to that realization and it was like, ah, oh. and then he basically his, his response was, Everything I was doing before is just like dung. It was rubbish compared to this reality. You know, the old covenant was a was completely non had no power within it whatsoever. But they still tried operating it. You know, and and Paul came to that realization. I'm weary of doing this effectively. Now I can see what is there available for me. I'm going after that. And he had a heavenly vision of what God was doing with amongst the Gentiles and within everybody, you know, and then started preaching that inclusive message to the world. It's our belief systems, you know, it's like our programming and we just automatically, you know, think things and we don't even understand necessarily why, why we're doing it. So uh, I found it really useful when, <clears throat> when you did that training on restoration and that the perspective that God is a rescuer always, he, he never kills anyone. And that, and it really put a different light on the Bible. And when you read it, that, that, you know, it was just people's belief systems that, you know, Satan was was actually his agent doing what he wanted when he wasn't. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there is there's a sense of so much deconstruction of the way we think needs to take place. Religious deconstruction, cultural deconstruction, all sorts of things that we thought we knew. But then you come to realize you didn't know at all. You know, and we are programmed. I mean, you know, coming from an evangelical background, you're programmed to accept the Bible as absolute, literally fact and totally 100 percent completely true. Um, and I think that therefore causes so many problems for people. Well, how can how can you say God is a loving God when he told them to kill all those children or do all this and do all that. And I think that's been a problem because of the nature of the understanding of what the Bible is, you know, and I think that has been our biggest issue. Trying to understand God through a book that two thirds of it wasn't written to us. And the other third of it was written to a group of people 2000 years ago. And most of what was said there is already past you know and therefore you're trying to understand something without the relationship through a mediator of a book and i understand why it's so difficult for people to to realize how god good god is when they look at the old testament and what they think was written there by god you know this thing that god inspired every bit of the old testament and the new testament is a problem how could he inspire those people who said lies he didn't inspire lies but the lies are recorded did he inspire the people to record the lies maybe but they recorded their understanding of god in a way which became progressively more who he really was and you once you get prophets starting to prophesy a new covenant they start to present god differently like god never wanted sacrifices and offerings but what have we been doing for the last 1500 years i imagine i imagine that's what they must have thought i mean if you heard a prophet telling you that god didn't want sacrifices and offerings how would have that made you feel about what you were doing to get to god by having to give all these sacrifices and offerings. And then some guy comes along and says, no, God never wanted that in the first place. Maybe it must have been like, well, either 
by not believing him. He's not a prophet because that contradicts what I think I know. Or, well, if it is God, well, what have I, what have we been doing all this time following this religious system of laws when God didn't require it? You know, and then you then get the New Testament where Jesus comes and basically reveals the true nature of God as love. And then that gets reaffirmed. God didn't never wanted sacrifices and offerings. But most of the evangelical community still believe in sacrifices and offerings, just New Testament ones. You know, you know and they still believe that God set up the law and the system of the law and they've set up their own laws. They're just New Testament laws you got to read your bible pray every day go to church do this do this do this and they're just new laws and people feel guilty if they don't do them jesus came to reveal who god really was and he came to reveal that god is love and anything that's contradictory to that is contradictory to the truth and i think that's the easiest way i think for us to understand something does it contradict god be in love well either my understanding of it is wrong or what's recorded wasn't recorded correctly or their understanding of what they recorded wasn't correct so did god tell them to destroy a whole group of people no he didn't because that is totally contradictory to god be in love now, K. Fairchild and people like that will say, well, it was just an analogy anyway. Because it was just a metaphor for dealing with things which are contradictory to God's best in our lives. Which you can take it that way. And that would give you a way of explaining what the Old Testament says. Because basically they're saying, well, it isn't really literal. It's just supposed to be a metaphor for our lives today. Do I accept that fully? Probably not, because I do believe there is some historical record there um but their understanding of god and their view of god clearly isn't correct you know and and that is how i would well and why would we expect it to be correct when most of them never really had a relationship with god and those they did was still an external relationship not an internal one so moses did meet god but he still had his issues and problems and he still did some stuff his own way. You know, and the people didn't want to meet God because they were afraid. Therefore, they set up a mediation system and Moses basically accommodated them and adapted a whole system to enable them to follow rules because they weren't wanting relationships. So they needed rules and they kept breaking the rules. So you have this system yeah yeah and i and i think if we look at that system and think that system was good well then we're totally flying in the face of the contradiction of paul saying you know the law was never going to solve any of these problems because it had no power to change anything it just had the power to reveal what wasn't right yeah my kind of like two contradictory statements uh, for all you're getting get understanding and then do not lead on your own understanding yeah and, and so one is the truth about something and one is the point of view of something and so that's the reason why my, like my friend is convinced that it's obvious he says that um, being born again is actually reincarnation i don't know what's wrong with you guys why you can't understand that <laughs> right and that's the reason why you have more than, a, I don't know how many translations of the Bible. Because mm. everybody, even when they translate, what could this have meant? And they give their own meaning and their own point of view when yeah. translating. So you have, you have these four mainstreams, everybody with their own point of view of Christianity and then 40,000 denominations underneath that. Because everybody has their own point of view. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And... You know, when you when you come to look at certain things like that, the Holy Spirit can give you some insight into God's meaning for something. If that's the way that you're trying to engage with God through the Bible, the Holy Spirit can still speak to you through it. Get the source. 
you know but the source yeah but if you go to the source then you don't need a book you know but you do need to have a relationship with god that enables you to know that god is good and god is love and therefore interpret stuff through that but otherwise you can still interpret it through your own understanding even what god says so god can tell you something and you can hear something else or interpret it the way that you think it should be interpreted rather than what it actually says so we've got to be careful to weigh everything in light of who god really is that's why we don't use our own understanding but getting understanding where do you get it from god so if we get our understanding from god then there's no problem getting understanding the problem is actually getting our own understanding independent from god and of course that's why it says don't lean to your own understanding because if it's independent from god it's going to be suspect that sometimes it might be okay and sometimes it might not and you don't know the difference that's the problem for most people they don't know the difference between what is and what isn't because they don't know god well enough you know if you don't know god well enough it's hard to actually gauge whether what you think he's saying to you or whatever is correct or not which is why jesus is the way the truth and the life you know and if you stick to following him he is going to lead you to a relationship with the father which will be intimate and which will reveal the truth of who god is which will enable you to understand things differently than trying to work it out and figure it out which is why i've got a problem with people basing their lives on theology which is their understanding of god through the bible which requires their understanding of the bible and as you say well whose bible which version which language whose interpretation what systematic theology are you follow in depending on whether you're a charismatic or a reformed or you're you know southern baptist or who you are you're all gonna have your own version of the, the your understanding of what it's saying you know which is why jesus wants us to hear his voice so that hearing his voice can give us the truth But we've got 2,000 years or 1,600 years of people forcing the Bible on us and saying this is the only way because this is God's word. And it really isn't God's word. You know, and they, it's all it's venerated as if it's as much God as God himself. And that creates a huge problem in then if this is god's word then every word in it must be god's well that's just plainly stupid really when you look at it because there's loads of other people's words in there very few of them are actually god's all jesus's words are god because he's god and everything he says that the father said is god but then when you look at other things a prophet is speaking and if New Testament prophets with the Holy Spirit in them prophesy in part, well, certainly Old Testament prophets, it's prophets when God wasn't in them are also going to testify in part and they're not always going to get it right. You know, um, so you, you do have this major problem of, well, what's true? You know, well, follow the truth. Follow Jesus. Learn to hear his voice. Learn to hear the voice of the truth. Oh, well, yeah, well, we do that through the Bible, who's the word of God. You know, well, no, actually, most people listen to someone else preaching about the Bible as the word of God. How many people actually do it for themselves? Not that many. And if they do, they're still working it out through their own mindsets and belief systems. And they will be programmed by someone's theology somewhere someone will have taught you some way of looking or reading the bible which will be the framework for which you use when you do read the bible you know unless you give the bible to someone and they have no background whatsoever of any religious system and you just basically say well read this and ask god to show you what it means 
but there's very few people who don't have some knowledge of Christianity or what it's supposed to mean. Therefore, they've already got some pre-understanding of God, of hell, or and some other cultural thing that has been taken from the Bible. And it's very difficult, unless you were sort of brought up in a jungle with no contact with the Western world, it's going to be really difficult to have a neutral perspective when you start. You know, and if people were brought up with a totally not no religious understanding at all of Christianity or God from that perspective, then why would you want to give them a book to help them? Just point them to Jesus. You know, I, I remember years ago, I had a, an Argentinian friend who was part of a, I think one of the big churches in Buenos Aires, which was like a hundred thousand people or something. And they did a major a mission to an area of Buenos Aires which was sort of unreached and you know troubled and so they they went into that area you know did all their preparation and prayer and everything like that and they went in and preached the gospel and a whole lot of people responded and then they were going to sign them all up to church and to you know, new believers courses and God spoke to them prophetically and said don't let me teach them so they've struggled with that big time hugely struggled to trust that god could teach them without them having a bible or without them having the church to teach them hugely struggle with it but give them their due they accepted but that must be god had a reason for it so they didn't do anything in that area for 12 months then they went back and they found that there was thriving community of of believers and they they didn't have bibles they didn't and they didn't have church stuff but they were their relationship with god was brilliant and i think that shows that god can do it you don't need us let's let him do it so mike i don't know if you have any insight at all but do you see something in our generation where god's going to kind of lift it off maybe the church in that that they, they can kind of tr get off the treadmill. Hmm. Uh, and I, I've listened to even people that are so well known that hear God, and yet they talk about, you know, the importance of you have to be good and right. And if you want to hear God, the pure, because only the pure in heart. Hmm. And the fact is, so when you, if you listen to something like that, you say, oh my goodness, they're a giant and, you know, they hear God. So if they do, I'd have to do the same thing. And it just gets you more on that treadmill. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and so that's the church. And the more fervent you are, the more difficult it becomes. Yes, uh, because essentially those people are programmed into thinking that you have to maintain some sort of standard to be acceptable to God. Therefore, they're not accepting the fact that you're already the righteousness of God in Christ, that you've already justified, you're already forgiven, you're already reconciled which was the finished work of Jesus. So they're not depending on the finished work of Jesus. They're depending on us complying with some sort of New Testament law. Rather than, hey, stick to what Jesus said, love one another, they added a whole load of stuff to it. And that means the behaviorals that they would think were good will be conditioned on the where they've been brought up and how that's how it worked in their christian upbringing you know and a lot of people are you must maintain righteousness well how do they think they can do that they couldn't do it before why do they think they can do it well we have the holy spirit in us yes we do but the holy spirit is there to affirm who god sees us and what god says about us not what religion says so, yeah, it is difficult and people get conditioned and programmed by the preachers who are also programmed themselves in works. Because most of evangelical theology is a works based theology. Because they believe unless you do this or do that, you won't be saved. So no matter what God's done, it's all dependent on you, whether you accept or don't accept. 
or whether you pray or don't pray or whether you do this or don't do this rather than well no actually it's all about what he's already done and us realizing what has already been done because salvation to them is about us doing something so god can do something which is works you know, evangelical Christianity is supposed to believe in salvation by faith or grace through faith. That's what it's supposed to be. But when you really break it down, well, you're separated from God. God can't accept you unless you repent and pray a prayer asking Jesus into your heart. And if you don't, you're separated from God. So the only way you can not be separated from God is if you do something. So then God can do something to you. Because they believe you're not born from above until you pray a prayer. The Holy Spirit is not in you until you pray a prayer. Or do whatever you do. So therefore, if you don't do that. It's all based on you. Not God. But when you actually look at what it says, that we're saved by grace through faith, that's not our own. So we can't boast that it's our faith that saved us. So if it's not our own, whose is it? The gift he's given us to believe and to accept what he's already done. But we've turned the whole thing completely 100 percent around 180 degrees to say, you must be born again where actually it says born from above and that's already taken place because everyone was born from above when jesus was resurrected and breathed into humanity the spirit and the spirit was poured out on all flesh and everybody that had fallen short of god's glory if you read romans three twenty three. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But they don't look at the next verse, 24, that basically says that they're all justified. So the same people that all fall short, and it's the same all, when you actually look at what it actually says, you people stop at the everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if you carry on with that, and you go further with that, um, you you actually begin to realize that it says the same people who've fallen short are now justified. You know, and I think that is the problem. We take one verse and we don't actually look at everything in context. So you've got Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. So in other words, all have outworked their lost identity and have fallen short of the glory of God. So in other words, they've not a lot been who God made them to be. Nothing to do with missing some mythical mark. It's just none one's lived in their true identity. And everyone accepts that. Well, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Then 24, verse 24 says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. So everyone who's fallen short of the glory of God has been justified by Jesus. That means that's a legal term to say they're not guilty. They're no longer seen as fallen short. Now, I never was ever shown that. And actually, I never even saw that. Even though it's plainly obvious. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace. So everyone who's fallen short has been justified. And therefore, you could say they're not guilty. They've been forgiven. They've been reconciled. No all by him and none of that is by us doing anything other than coming to a realization of what he's already done and i think that's part of the problem we've been told half the story and then told we have to do something to complete the second half of the story 
but it's plainly obvious from 2 Corinthians 5 19 God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not holding anything against them so there's lots of things that point to the fact that we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ but people will say oh yeah but that's only Christians doesn't apply to everybody only those who pray a prayer and believe well plainly it says god did it so our whole gospel has become a works-based gospel and therefore the whole christian life if you live that evangelical thing is a works-based christian life because you've got to maintain the standard that you entered into by praying a prayer so you've got to maintain your being sorry for sin and asking god for forgiveness all the time and you've got to maintain their wrong understanding of the word repentance. So you've got to keep repenting, keep doing penance, essentially. So keep trying to make amends for what you've done wrong. And that is a works-based way of living. And really, it doesn't help at all. And you get preachers then basically saying, well, you've got to be this to hear God. Or you've got to do this to be good enough for God. Works. So it's a mixing of covenants, effectively. Hmm. And we've been told it's our faith that saves us. So, Mike, just to, just to follow through a little bit further. So someone on earth that never has the experience of, of God through Christ, when they die, they go to that place of Shoal or where, whatever it's called, and is it that they have to then because say jeff had the experience of god through christ on earth he's he's made it and he's gonna jeff doesn't make it when jeff finally leaves this earth he's automatically in heaven but someone that jeff knows his hindu friend that didn't experience god through christ they go to shoal and they have to they have to go through the experience or like i'm just trying to get like because yeah. it has to be the same okay. thing again doesn't it what you do on earth, you do it now or you're going to do it later. Yeah, um, I think I think there's there's different ways of looking at it. A, Sheol, the grave, Hades, whatever you call that place has been emptied and is no, no longer in existence. So before Jesus went to the cross, people were in a holding location until jesus went there and preached to them and led them all out of that holding location after that there is no holding location but there is the presence of god's love that if people choose to reject the way the offer that jesus has given them they, they go into that place of god's love for his love as a consuming fire to purify and refine and remove every obstacle or hindrance or objection they have to accepting Jesus. But I think there's also another state in the everyone who dies, Jesus comes to as the light and gives them the choice to accept what he has done there and then. So many, many people who have heard the gospel, some version of it, or have some idea of who Jesus is, will accept him on their deathbed and don't go into the fire of God's love. They go directly to God through Jesus because he invites them to come through him on the point of death. Hence, when people have near-death experiences, they quite often see a tunnel of light or they feel the light is drawing them and all this sort of stuff. So majority of people accept the light at that point even if they don't know jesus they know the light is a good thing so they come to the light and then they realize that jesus is the light that they're coming to there may be some who are programmed not to trust jesus or to believe that christianity and jesus is a false religion particularly muslims who may not accept jesus when he offers them for forgiveness and salvation on that point of death it, they would then go into the fire for their self-righteousness or their own workspace religion to be consumed 
And then when they come to that realization that, ah, uh, I made the wrong choice, they can change that choice. Some of them may be absolutely self-righteously uh, unwilling to change that choice. But a God's love will outlast their willingness to resist. There are some who have believed in other religions, in other systems of belief, who might struggle with Jesus and may not accept him at that point. But hopefully they will find once they're faced with their own understanding, I've uh, brought them into a place in which they're now feeling um, self-tormented, anguish of soul, realizing that they even on the point of death, they fail to accept Jesus. They're going to realize they made a big mistake. But it isn't punishment or torment that they're receiving to get them to change their mind. It's love. It's God's loving them or wanting to them to experience his love, which brings about the change. Now, some are so broken and so fragmented and so damaged, it's really hard for them to accept. And you can imagine a whole load of people who potentially have suffered, I don't know, abuse by priests or all that type of stuff, who would have a very negative view of God based on how they've been treated by the religious system. So, you know, and they're right throughout history. You can imagine all those people who were threatened with the sword, you know, die, accept Jesus or die. You know, all the Vikings who were basically told they're being killed unless they got baptized. I mean, all this stuff, they're going to have a pretty negative view. And they may not accept Jesus at that point. But later on, faced with their own choice and God's love, God's love will win them over. Because who can be separated from the love of God? Nobody. It's just they have to have their minds renewed to, again, accept the truth in that place of God's love, which appears like a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. Well, he's not burning anyone or tormenting anyone or torturing anyone. He's wanting to refine and purify and remove any obstacle of them receiving his love. So I think there's different ways in which people can come to accept what Jesus has done after they die or on the point of death. But I know God's love will never fail. But some people also feel totally unworthy. So they're programmed by their own unworthiness. Well, I'm not good enough. And other religions will promote that. Hence, well, if you come back as something else, you know, in reincarnation, well, you've got to do a better job the next time around. That That's the whole programming. Because it's based on works, even Buddhism and things like that, which is sort of has a lot of really good stuff in it about how to love people and treat people well and all that. If you don't get it right, you still got to do it better the next time. So it still works based, not grace based. And until people are willing to accept by grace that they have been saved and they're still trying to do it themselves, then they're not going to receive it. You have to come by grace. You have to say, well, I can't do it. I'm going to receive it for free. And for me to believe that, he has gifted me the ability to believe it. And that gift of faith is available to everyone, whether they're on earth or in that realm of God's love, but they've not yet known God. And not only, not exactly. Mike, yeah. is that you're, when you're initially going there, probably afterwards to that place, there was... I, I believe you experienced all the torment that they're in. Anguish. I would say anguish. And that's really what we have to always be drawn at. This place of just eternal suffering yeah. and you yeah. know, paying the price. It's an anguish, but it's not God's punishment. It's God's love that is bringing them to a point of facing their choices and realizing they don't have to suffer for their choices any longer. But their self anguish, self anguish, it's like realizing because 
they've been people have been programmed to believe you can't get out of hell that's that is if you go to hell if you're in the fire whatever well that's it it's eternal torment and punishment so if people find themselves in a place which is they don't know anybody else you know people are not partying it up there or interacting with anyone else it is a complete isolation everyone is completely isolated in their own understanding and therefore they're facing that and they're probably coming to some realization that there is a life after death because they're not dead and they're still conscious they're conscious still so there's not just annihilation or not failing to exist Hence, a whole load of people who are atheists who don't believe there's anything after death are suddenly realizing, yes, there is. Well, what are they going to be thinking? Oh, the Christians had it right all along. Well, actually, no, the Christians didn't have it right all along. And actually, you're not being tormented and punished in hell. But now you're thinking you are. So you've got to help them come to the point where they reject the fact that they're stuck there forever now. And they're realizing that they're stuck there because of their own choices. So they're tormenting themselves saying, oh, I wish I'd made a different choice. Regret, remorse, all of those things. And they're then faced with maybe what they've done in their life that has contributed to where they are. But that's why we've got to preach to them the true gospel, that God loves them. And they can be brought into a relationship with God there and then through Jesus. But you have to find a way of preaching to them that they can receive. So it's not a, it's not enough just to go and, you know, carte blanche. Oh, well, Jesus loves you. Just come to Jesus now. Because they might not believe that or they might struggle to accept that. So you have to help them to come to that realization by sharing God's love in a way that's relevant to them. And that's what I've done many times when going there is find the way to reach those that I'm speaking to. And that means I share the good news in different ways. You know, for those who are broken and fragmented, I preach to them that they can come into a wholeness so they can accept Jesus. Because you're how many altars are you talking to? How many split personalities are you trying to communicate to? And they're all in fear or anguish or pain or torment or whatever. So you've got to find a way of reaching them. You know, that's why I took once a whole load of cloud of witnesses to go with me to forgive those who persecuted them. Because those people who were there didn't feel that they were able to be forgiven because they were face to face with their own well they don't what they did to others and when you get people coming and say well i forgive you that is a powerful statement of what the gospel is so it's available mike um, yeah. i'm sure whether you've tried if it, any person is transitioned or he's here if you're exposed to the unconditional love of God, like even Paul did. Mm. I'm sure he must have gone through the same kind of anguish because once you see unconditional love, you always look at your own life, you know, and you and there's this anguish as to, I would have lived my life differently if I knew God's love. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is the same thing that they experienced there because now their lives are gone and it could have been different, totally different. I think that's the kind of anguish that uh, everybody yeah, goes it through. It is. And regret. It's very much that way. And, and I think Paul faced that when he experienced God in the light and he, and he was and God revealed people. Jesus in him. He then went into the desert and I think to face the fact that he didn't, believed all this stuff all this time and he was resisting what god was trying to do in revealing love and it must have been a difficult scenario because he had to say well potentially his, his thing was look i was a hebrew of hebrews i was a pharisee i was this i was that i was that but it's all rubbish complete dung because it's all works you know and i came to the realization it's all grace and he was 
but you know, persecuting. Easy. He was persecuting yeah. people also. Yeah. You know? Absolutely, and he had to face that he would effectively was a murderer if he if Christians had died as a result of what he had done, which must have been really hard. But that is why, at the very outset, it says in Galatians one sixteen that that Paul said that god was pleased to reveal his son in me and that he was already at work in him he wasn't separated from him that god loved him in such a way that he was already at work in him but he would have been resisting it hence then he could say like 2 corinthians five nineteen, god was in christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against because he realized that god hadn't counted his trespasses against him and even though he had done all these things, God's grace and mercy had forgiven him. So he had to accept his forgiveness, which must have been quite difficult having to face. I've been persecuting those who were, you know, God's messengers. And I got it wrong. So it couldn't have been easy. And I'm sure he had remorse and regret but he also had the knowledge of forgiveness that God had given him at the point of his salvation. So he, I think he worked it through. When he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, I think that's what he was doing. Coming to the terms that God's grace and mercy and love had overcome all the rubbish in his life. By complete grace and through no works. Which was an amazing thing. But if you have to do that, wherever you are, I do think there's a sense of, you know, reflection, which can feel like, oh, look at all the terrible stuff I did. Look at all the people I hurt. And as much as you realize God has forgiven you, you still feel bad about it. You still feel remorse. But that isn't repentance. That's not doing penance. Oh, now I feel resource. I've got to make amends. I've got to do it right, put it right. Because you realize, no, I could never put it right. But I've been forgiven by God. You know, and I'm sure Paul would have apologized to people that he tried to persecute. When he eventually got to Damascus. Because they didn't trust him, did they? <laughs> yeah, because it's like what you're coming you, we you're coming here to persecute us and you're saying now you're trying to infiltrate us you are you know and actually you know they didn't trust him which you can understand but i'm sure he apologized to them because he was faced with what he had done and how had that affected other people in a negative way and he felt remorse but it wasn't remorse towards god because he knew god had forgiven him by grace through faith and that wasn't even his because that's why he wrote all this stuff because he had a revelation of this but it still would have made him feel bad towards those people that he had hurt and i think that is a right reaction we shouldn't blasely say oh, well i've been forgiven by god so oh, it doesn't really matter what i've done if we genuinely receive god's forgiveness we would also feel his heart to those that we had hurt And we would have come to that realization. And forgiving oneself is one of the most difficult things also. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is the key. Not going around trying to flagellate yourself and whip yourself and, you know, kneel on broken glass and wear hair shirts because you need to, you need to acknowledge how terrible you've been. But you do need to acknowledge now there's got to be a change in how I engage with people. You know, and I think that's what, when you know how much love God has loved you and forgiven you, then you can begin to think of him, other people, but also forgive yourself. And I think that is hard, but it's like when I know God has forgiven me, I can't hold on to it myself any longer because that will contradict what God's done. But it's not the easy because of the way people have been made to feel about what they've done. God didn't make them feel bad. Well, what made them feel bad? I guess their own self or other people. 
Yeah. So God definitely wants us to know we're forgiven so we can live as forgiven, therefore forgiving ourselves and making sure we then forgive other people for anything they do, which contradicts God's love towards us. Yeah. Which is why forgiveness is at the heart of the gospel. It's the heart of it. God has forgiven us. Let's also live in forgiveness towards others. Is Mike, so when the scripture says mm. every knee sh shall bow and every tongue confess, that's referring to everybody that mm. ever existed. Yes. It's not, you go, you guys in hell, you're going to see and you're going to find out and you're going to do it too. Have a good time. It's everybody because they're going to be with him because they are. So that is the assurance because that everybody, even the people that are in that with him and that consuming fire now are going to be there with every, with us and everyone else. Yeah, absolutely. And all those who were pre the cross are already there. All of them, because Jesus emptied Sheol when he preached the good news there and led captivity captive. It's just after the cross. That responsibility for preaching the gospel is ours. So, so Mike, does that mean you, you <laughs> when you look at, say, if, if you're outside today, walking down the street, you see people, you know, in your own heart with assurance that they're going to be there with you in eternity oh, with God. Absolutely. There's children. not anyone that's, that's going to miss no, it. They're children of God. I know that they may resist that, but I know that they cannot. God is patient and tolerant and kind. And his kindness leads us to change our thinking about that whole reality. Therefore, I know God is never going to not be kind, tolerant and patient. And his patience will outlast anyone's objections. And it is the fire of his love, which is consuming and purifying and removing those objections. Not burning people and tormenting them, but burning away every objection until there's no objections left for them actually receiving what he has done already for them. And experiencing that in fullness and coming into the knowledge of their relationship with the father through Jesus and entering into sonship. Yeah, because I don't believe every anyone is outside of the scope of what Jesus has done. He took away the sin of the world. So he's already taken their lost identity from his perspective. They're already been made righteous. They've already been born from above. They've already been forgiven. They've already been reconciled. They've already been justified. And they've already been made righteous. They just don't realize it. They will all come to the realization because all of them were predestined to face to face return to innocence. Even before the foundation of the world or the fall of the world. Ephesians 1, 4. It was God's intention that none would be lost, that none would perish. That's what it says. It's God's wish, God's intention, God's purpose, that none would perish. And I don't believe anyone will, because the word perish means to be lost. And I don't believe anyone will ultimately be lost. But the length of time it takes for them to come to the realization is still down to them. But God is wanting us to reach out to them even now where they are. So that they can hear that good news. And respond. You know, in that way. Yeah. Mike, does that mean with absolute? Is this an absolute that God is not doesn't matter what a person is outworking their harm to take them out? Because of what the harm they're doing to other people. It's what they're doing is actually their actions harming them that are resulting in maybe their demise. But yeah. God is no, God cannot harm and will not harm anyone. Is that an absolute? Yeah. God doesn't harm anybody. Even a he, bad person, a really bad person. Yeah. yeah because they're, but they're, they're not the enemy. Never. No, they're his children. He loves them. He loves everyone equally the same. Because he's hasn't he's created everyone for a relationship with him. It's their consequences of their actions that bring about the things that happen in their lives. If they sow bad things, they're going to reap bad things. Only God's mercy will stop them reaping bad things. And God is merciful, so he doesn't want them to reap bad things. But it, he allows people to make the choices and suffer the consequences, not so they will be punished, so they will realize that their choices were wrong and they will then not make those choices anymore and make a better choice, which is following him. So he didn't punish people to follow him. He didn't like, OK, 
follow him or else. It's love. It is his kindness, tolerance and patience that leads people to change their mind about him. Not a threat. A fear. So a lot of the gospel I've ever heard is all about fear. It's about fear of what will happen to you if you don't. Rather than what will happen for you if you do, which is you will receive the love of God and you will be transformed and you will be changed and you'll enter into the full identity. So no, I don't believe there's anyone outside of what Jesus has done, but they can choose to resist that for as long as they want to. I just don't feel that ultimately they'll resist it forever because God's love wins. So when I when I've heard in the, the past as someone in authority saying God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah. You know, so they're saying, you know what, those people, because God's for us, they you're you're cro they're crossing the line with God's elect. <laughs> yeah, because they've turned they've twisted that thing against and, and made people enemies. It just means that if God is for us, nothing that anyone does can hinder what God wants to do in our lives, ultimately. That's all it's saying. It's not saying God's against those people or we should be against those people because Jesus said, well, love your enemies, pray for them. They were leaning on their own understanding. Yes, they were. Absolutely. That's exactly what they were doing. <laughs> If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.